of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Amen. Well, my prayer is that the Word of God has a significant place in your life. I hope that God's Word is so important to you that you find time every single day to spend some time reading God's Word, studying God's Word, memorizing God's Word, applying God's Word. It has the answers for every problem in life and every question in life. It has the solutions for everything. It has great principles to live by. It's our roadmap to heaven. It's our roadmap for all of life, right? So I hope you find a, an important place in your life uh, to place the Word of God. I want to matter draw fact, you to johncannonnotes.com. is where I want you to go on your tablet, your phone, whatever, for your sermon notes and all the scripture that I'll be looking at today. You can go there and follow along with us. Also, at johncannonnotes.com, there's a place that says, let's get connected, a card that says, let's get connected. Click that. If you make any decision today, if you have any prayer request, if you have any information you want to get to me or share with me, or maybe God's speaking to you about something through this message today, let me know about that by simply going to that link there and filling that out and it comes directly to me. I hope you enjoy this verse by verse study that we are doing through First Peter. I hope it's not boring to you. I hope it's not uh, something that you have to labor through. There's so many good, godly principles and doctrine that's found in this epistle of 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, through chapter 2, verse 10. Now, don't be alarmed. You know as well as I do, there's no way in the world I can preach that much material in one message, right? You know that's not going to happen. I, I've, I actually have broken this message down into four parts, okay? So this is going to be 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, 2 through 10, part 1. Then there's going to be a part 2. Then there's going to be a part 3. Then there's going to be a part 4. And the reason that I'm doing that, and I sent this out in a text message earlier this week, and I hope that you, you got that. Adversity, times of difficulty, does really two things to a group of people. Now, I say a group of people because it can, that group of people can be a family. That group of people can be on your job or in your unit. That group of people can be your church. Whatever that group of people is that is experiencing adversity together... The results of that is going to be one of two things. Either there is going to be unity with that group, and they're going to discover how to have unity, or there is going to be animosity. In other words, they are going to come together as a result of the stress, as a result of the adversity, as a result of the difficulty that they're going through. They're going to come together and come out stronger, or animosity is going to set in and the group's going to be divided and they're going to be biting each other and they're going to be destroying one another and there's going to be great division among that group of people. Why do I say that? 
Why do I say this? Why do I bring this up in 1 Peter? Well, let's go back and review. Who wrote the book of 1 Peter? Talk to me. It's a simple question. (laughs) Peter, right? Peter wrote this. Now, who was he writing to? Where was he writing from? He was in Rome, right? Who is he writing to? He's writing to the believers that are scattered. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 and 3, you'll see that they're scattered over the region of Rome. Why are they scattered? Do you remember? Because they're now starting to be persecuted. Okay? Now, Peter has his thumb on the pulse of the political agenda of the day. If you remember, the writings of 1 Peter was somewhere around A.D. 62, 63. History tells us that something very significant took place in A.D. 64. What do we know that took place in A.D. 64? The old saying is, Rome burned while Nero fiddled. A.D. 64. What's the significance of that? Because Nero wanted to rebuild Rome and have all the grand and glory of that. History leans, a theory says that Nero himself actually set the fire and started burning his own city so that he could rebuild it and get all the glory for it. But he needed a scapegoat. He couldn't let his political career would be devastated if rumor got out that he set the fire. So who did he blame this fire on? He blamed it on those believers, those Christians, right? He talked about how they were a peculiar group of people. Now, Peter knew. Peter knew that Nero was getting ready to turn up the thermostat of persecution on these believers. And he knows, if you will, put that slide back up, please, about adversity. He knows that adversity is already there. Times of difficulty is already there. Stress stress and pressure is already there on these believers. And he's concerned about something. He's concerned about their unity. He's concerned about them staying together as a group of believers. He's also concerned about them dividing and going their own ways and fighting with one another and checking out of this thing called Christianity. Why? Because Peter's concerned about that because that's kind of what he did back in the day. If you remember, when he faced some adversity, he quit. You remember? And he went fishing, went back to his old way of living. And of course, the Lord came to him by the seaside and what have you. And he realized that the Lord and and that great passage of scripture where the Lord told him three different times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? me?" You remember that passage? That's when Peter was restored, if you will. So what he what he's thinking of is I do not want you guys to do what I did. Right. I know that adversity can cause you to quit. I know that times of difficulty can cause you to throw in the towel. I know that pressure on you and the persecution that you're experiencing can cause you to turn on each other. So therefore, he says, I want to share something with you that hopefully and prayerfully is going to show you how you can be unified in the midst of adversity and why you should have unity in the midst of adversity, pressure, stress, difficult seasons in your life. Now, I don't know that we really experience persecution like they were experiencing persecution here, but we certainly have our, I guess, load of stress that we we deal with on a daily basis. We have our seasons of difficulty that we go through as a believer. The spiritual life is mountaintops and valleys and mountaintops and valleys and mountaintops and valleys, right? Your life is like that. The church life is like that. Your Christian life is like that. So if you're not facing any adversity yet, then I just want to say, hold on, it's coming. 
right? Because really in the valleys and the hard places of life is where God, that's where you really learn. That's where the Lord is teaching you some things. But you got to be sure that you make the right decisions as you work your way through that. This is really what sums up 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, through chapter 2, verse number 10. Peter is sharing with them that in the midst of adversity, in the midst of persecution, and by the way, Nero is getting ready to intensify that. I just know it's coming. Now, he didn't know that he was going to burn Rome and blame it on. He didn't know that. But he knew, you know, you can feel when the pressure is coming, right? When the pressure is on. He could sense that for these believers. They were already being persecuted. And he said, I want to show you how, and I want to show you why you should, unify during these times, and hopefully not let animosity set in. So that's the premise of what I'm going to be talking about for the next four weeks, or today and three more weeks as we break this section up in the four pieces. Now, I hope I can get through what I'm going to share with you today, right? There's a lot to talk about here. Now, I've asked Paul and Dustin to lean into this passage already. So they have leaned into this and did a great job unpacking what they shared with you straight from God's Word. But I'm going to come from a different angle. I'm going to come from the angle of the context of the Scripture on why Peter is writing and who he's writing to and exactly what is taking place and how they can have unity. And I hope and pray that you will find value in what I'm going to share with you today, that when you go through difficult seasons in life, that you will learn your family will grow stronger. Your group that you're associated with will find strength and bind in unity. That our church, whenever we go through adversity and seasons of difficulty and pressure, that we will come together with one mind and one accord in unity and not allow animosity and division and backbiting and, and talking and what have you settle in among us, okay? Are you there in 1 Peter chapter 1? Let's look. I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation out of 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse number 22, and I'm just going to read the text through chapter 2 and verse number 10 just so you can kind of absorb it a little bit and sit in the text of Scripture and try to see exactly what it is that Peter is writing to us. Are you there? I say get it. You say got it. Good. Here we are. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's look in verse number 22. He says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. And then he says, love each other deeply with all of your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scripture says, and by the way, the scripture that he's quoting here is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 down through verse number 8. But he says, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Chapter 2, verse 1. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit and hypocrisy and jealousy and unkind speech. That's the animosity that I was talking about. Get rid of that, he says. But like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for it like nourishment. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Verse 4. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you, key phrase, are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, here, another key phrase, you are holy priest. 
through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Think about those. Are we offering spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing unto God? We should be, and I'll unpack that in a few weeks. Okay, we're not getting to that today. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scripture says, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor that God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And... He is the stone that makes people stumble. Do people stumble over Jesus today? Oh, yeah, they stumble over him every single day. They don't stumble over religion. They don't care if you are religious. They don't stumble over a God that you may have, but they stumble over every day over the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock. That makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that. Now remember he's talking to these Christians who are being persecuted. Who are scattered abroad in the regions that's mentioned in 1 Peter chapter number 1. The beginning, the first part of it. But you are not like that. You are a, get this now. And we leaned into this several weeks back. You are a what? A chosen people. You are what? Royal priest. Well, I'm going to unpack that. That, Not today. In a couple weeks. That's good stuff. Because we've got a duty. We've got a job. We're just not to come and sit and soak in a spiritual sauna. If we just come and sit and soak here and don't ever do anything, you're going to rot, decay, right? You're going to wither up. You ever been in the water too long and your hands start withering up? (laughs) You don't want to come here and sit in a spiritual sauna and just sit and soak and eventually sour? No, we got work to do. Every single one of us got work to do. We're called. We are a chosen people, it says. Royal priests. We are a holy nation. We are God's very own possession. That's a pinnacle point in this passage of Scripture. Matter of fact, that's a life-altering sentence or point that he's giving us right here that should impact and change the way that we live our life as a believer. This gives purpose and value to our life as a Christian and how we are to live live out our life. I'll lean into that more in the weeks to come. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity whatsoever. You had no identity. Right? Apart from Christ, you're nothing. Apart from Christ, I'm nothing. And he's saying, once you had no identity as a people. Now you are God's people. You talk to people that have self-esteem issues. They just haven't been introduced to Jesus. Right? You understand who you are in the person of Jesus Christ. It brings value to your life. It should bring self-esteem to your life. It should bring good thoughts to your life. Because listen, look what he says. Once you had no identity as a people of God, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. That's good scripture, right? That's good reading right there. And I hope you study that more this week. But I want to go back to our key thought on what adversity does. Adversity, times of difficulty, it does one of two things to a group of people. It's going to unify us. It's going to bring unity among us. Or it's going to divide us and cause animosity to set in. Now, let me give you a biblical example of both of these as a way of introduction So you will understand what Peter's alluding to here. He's concerned about these believers and Christians that are being scattered around the provinces of Rome because of persecution that is setting in on them. And he doesn't want them in these times of adversity and difficulty. He does not want animosity and backbiting. That's what he's saying in chapter 2, verse 1. Get rid of evil behavior and deceit and hypocrisy and jealousy and unkind speech. He doesn't want that to settle in among these believers because they're under stress. Parents, you ever bark at your kids 
in a way that maybe you have to ask for forgiveness of because you were in a time of stress when something came up? Say amen or oh me, but raise your hand. We've all done it, right? You got to ask for forgiveness, right? That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, listen, I know you're under stress. I know there's great pressure upon you. I know that persecution is coming, but you cannot turn on each other at this time. You must come together and be unified, be one. Now, we have a biblical example of both of these. I want to share that with you. If you will, look in Acts chapter 12. Go in your Bibles and turn. I think I've got the reference. I'm not sure I've got the verse mentioned at johncannonnotes.com in my sermon notes. But in Acts chapter 12, this is the early days of the church. Herod, somewhat like Nero, he really didn't like these Christians running around. He was concerned more about his political clout and the religious leaders of the day finding approval in his leadership than he was of doing what was right. Do you, we don't have any of that in our day that we live in, do we? Hello? About that time, King Herod, I'm in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. I hope you're there with me. Bring your Bibles on Sunday morning, whether a digital copy or a hard copy. I use both. I have it on my phone. I have it on my tablet. I have hard copies. I use it all, right? So whatever you use, bring it. We're studying together. We are studying God's Word. Listen, this is the only time we do that collectively together, right? This is the only place I know where you can go and get this, to church, right? Don't know that you can go to every church and get this. Say amen or me, right? About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. Now, Herod had already brought persecution to these early believers, and he had, I'm sorry, he had James killed with the sword, right? Pretty intense persecution that's taking place here. And when Herod, get this, Here's where he, where I say he was more concerned about his political approval rate among the religious leaders of the day than he was among about doing what was right. Verse three, when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he then arrested Peter, right? James, he killed the Jewish leaders of the day were excited that Herod had killed James because hopefully they would stop this thing called Christianity that they were preaching about being born again and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Jewish religious leaders of the day were upset about that, but they loved King Herod because he killed James and he now put Peter in prison. Do you think there's persecution among the believers? Is there? Yeah. I mean, one of your leaders just got killed with a sword. By the political leader, the king of the day, just killed him. And he took your other leader, which, by the way, had preached earlier and thousands had been saved. He now took him and put him in prison. And look what it said. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him in verse four. He imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Get this. Herod intended to bring Peter out for a public trial after the Passover. So he was going to do the same thing to Peter that he had already done to James. And he was going to do it publicly so he could get a few more political checks on his approval rating box from the Jewish leaders of the day. Verse 5. Key verse. Underline this verse in your Bible. I don't know if you mark in your Bibles or anything, but I've got this one highlighted and underlined because this is what the church did in the midst of adversity, pressure, difficulty, persecution. This is what the church did. Here is your example of unity with the church. They could have turned on each other. They could have said, we're done. We're out of here. They could have split, right? But no, verse 5 says, while Peter was in prison, the church did something. You tell me, so I know you're looking in your Bibles. What did it, what'd they do? They prayed earnestly for Peter. James, one of their leaders, Herod had already killed. Peter, he probably would have already killed had it not been for the Passover celebration which he probably could care less about, but he knew the religious leaders of the day were honoring that and celebrating that, so he didn't do, want to do anything that would upset them. So he put Peter in prison. 
said, hey, I want four troops there and four men. I want you guys guarding him. Put him in chains. Put him in prison. Once Passover is done, I'm going to bring him out publicly in front of everybody. And I'll put him on trial. We're going to find him guilty. I'll kill him too, just like I did James. That's the thought process of Herod. What did the church do? The church said, oh, we better get together and we better pray. Verse number five, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Look at verse six. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, Peter was asleep. Fastened with two chains beside two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Verse seven. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell. And an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Get up! Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed, put on your sandals. And he did. And now put on your coat and follow me. And the angel, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time... He thought it was a vision. In other words, Peter thought he was dreaming, right? He just thought this was a vision. He didn't think this was a real thing. He thought he was having a dream, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. Verse 10, they passed the first and the second guard post and they came to the iron gate leading to the city and this opened for them all by itself. There are some miraculous things happening here. I hope you're catching that. Chains falling off. Guards falling asleep, not watching their posts, gates opening up on their own. Some miraculous thing, an angel of the Lord coming, right? That bright light that's in there in the jail cell. They passed the first, second guard, the gate opened up. So they passed through and started walking down the street. Then the angel suddenly left. Then in verse 11, Peter finally came to his senses. This is really true. This is really happening to me, right? This is not a dream. Right. This is not a vision. This is really true. He said, the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. And when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for what? For prayer. Now here you'll find Peter knocking on the door and they're still in there praying like church. Hey, wake up. God's done answered your prayer. They're still in there praying. He's here. Right. What happened in adversity? Unity, right? Unity took place in the midst of adversity and pressure. The church got together and prayed. Now, when we have seasons of difficulty as a church, when you have seasons of difficulty as a family, when you have time of difficulty in your own personal life, I hope you'll do what this early church did. They came together in one accord, in unity, and they prayed. Now, Put this slide back up, if you will, again, please, on adversity, unity. And then now let me give you an example of animosity. Adversity, times of difficulty, does one of two things to a group of people. Hopefully it will unify us, as I just shared with you that it did for the early church when James had been killed and Peter in prison. Secondly, there's an example of animosity that is setting in. Now, this one you're going to have to go back in the Old Testament and you're going to have to go back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter number 6. Now this is going to be um, some hard reading here. Crazy things that took place here. First Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 24 down through verse number 30. There was an attack from Ben-Hadad, the leader of the Syrians. He led them into an attack into Samaria. Now in Samaria, the Israel's, Israelites, some of the Israelites were there in Samaria. The king of Israel was even there at that time. And Ben Hadad the, sent this attack, he was leading the Syrians, sent this attack into this area. I want you to look in chapter 6, verse 24. Are you there? I realize we're going to a lot of scripture today. I hope that's okay with you. Right? Right? This is our final authority in all of life. This is what we live by. And hopefully it's okay that we turn a few pages and study. You guys okay with this? Huh? You guys at home okay with this? Hey, Amen or good stuff or something. And somebody let me know they're listening, right? I can't see the comments here. Okay. Animosity is going to set in with this group of people. Look what happens. Sometime later, however, King Ben-Hadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged 
Samaria. Verse 25, 2 Kings chapter 6. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver. And a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. Now you got to understand, when King Ben-Hadad went in and conquered Syria, or Samaria, he's the leader of the Syrian army, went in and conquered, there was a great fame besieged the city, locked it down, took over. There was a famine that took place among the people. They were hungry. There was adversity. There was difficulty. There was pressure. There was stress. They were doing everything they could do just to survive. As a matter of fact, they were killing donkeys and the head of a donkey sold for 80 pieces of silver. You know what they were doing with the head of the donkey? Eating as much meat or whatever that they could get off the head of a donkey because the famine had set in. You guys tracking with me here? Difficulty, adversity had set in, right? A famine had set in. They even went as far, you see the dung that those doves are leaving behind? Maybe we could get some protein out of that. Are you with me? So now they're buying a cup of dove's dung for five pieces of silver and eating it. Would you agree? Adversity had set in with this group of people. Stress had set in with this. Famine had set. They're in survival mode. All of a sudden, one day in verse 26, get this. One day, the king of Israel was walking along the wall of a city. And a woman called out to him, please help us. Please help me, my lord, the king, is what she said. He answered in verse 27, if the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do? This is the king of Israel. If God doesn't help you, there's nothing I can do. There's a famine taking place. Look what she, he says. I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But the king then asked, what is the matter? No, what's wrong? This lady looks up, see the king walking on the wall. She's crying out to him for help. He said, the Lord doesn't help you. There's nothing I can do. I have no food. I have no wine. There's nothing I can do. What's wrong with you? Look what she says. She replied, this woman, there was a woman with her, looks at her. This woman said to me, come on. Let's eat your son today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So this woman said to the king, we cooked my son and ate him. Then the next day I said to her, kill your son so we can eat him. But she hid her son. The pressure of survival was so great that they turned to cannibalism ate her own son just to survive. Put my slide back up, please. Would you admit that animosity had already set in here among these group of people? Right? There's examples in the Bible when adversity in times of difficulty come, one of two results are going to happen to a group of people. There's either going to be unity or there's going to be animosity and division among them. Animosity and division is setting in here to where cannibalism is setting in. Now, I told you I was going to say something about the king early, earlier. And behind every smiling face, there is a heartache. Here's something I want you to see in verse number 30. When the king heard this, he tore his clothes in despair. And the king walked along the wall and the people could see, get this, that he was wearing burlap under his robe next to his skin. The authorized version, the King James Version, says he was wearing sackcloth. 
Any time in the biblical days when they would put on sackcloth and ashes among them, it was a season of mourning. There was heavy grief. The king, however, was the king of Israel. He was the leader of the people. He cannot let the people see his weakness that he was grieving and in mourning. So he had on his outer garment and on the outside everything looked good. But when he ripped that off because despair that he was in, when he heard that his own mothers of his people were eating their children because of the famine, then the people saw the sackcloth or the burlap that he had on under his outer garment. He too was carrying a heavy burden. Let this go to say, remember this point all through life. I don't care who people are. People are people. And behind every face, there's a heartache. Behind every smile, if you ask the right questions and you get to know the people well enough and they open up to you, The smile will leave their face and tears will come from their eyes and they will share with you the burden that they are carrying. So listen, that's true of your boss. That's true of your spouse. That's true of everyone in your family. That's true of everybody you work with. That's true of everybody in this church. Behind every face, there's a heartache. We all have had difficulty. We all have had life that we've had to live some hard things to get through, some hard valleys, deep valleys we've had to walk through. Even the king of Israel here under his outer garment is wearing burlap. So my point is this, and by the way, I think I'm going to close with this. I'm not even going to get to my first point. This is just my introduction today. So this now turned into five messages, right? Listen, pressure's coming. You may be in it right now. You may be under pressure right now. You may be faced with adversity right now. It may be finances. It may be relationships. It may be physical sickness. It may be a death experience of a loved one and a family member that you're having a hard time getting over. We've all kind of been there, haven't we? I hope that you'll take the example of the church that prayed. In the midst of adversity, let us be a people that comes together and prays and calls on God and loves each other. Oh, man, I want to go a little further. What time is it? It's 1130. You give me a minute here? Go back in 1 Peter chapter 1. I want you to look at verse number 22. This is why Peter is telling the people, I want you to love each other. Right? Look at verse 22. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must, now you must what? Now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. And then he says, you must love each other deeply. By the way, in the Greek, there's several different words for love. The first word that he uses here is Philadelphia. It's a brotherly love, right? Love each other. Have sincere. That word sincere means without wax in the Greek. It's, it interprets without wax. It's the idea of a, of a potter making the clay and making a pot. And, and maybe the pot had cracked and he's put it on the wheel and he's patched it up and he's put some clay on the outside of it and the inside of it. And then he sells that for a high value, but yet it's got a crack in it. And the crack is not going to be revealed until it's put under intense pressure or heat. Then all of a sudden, whoever bought it is going to realize that it has a crack in it. It wasn't sincere. It had wax in it, right? So he's saying, do not have a fake love for each other. Don't put wax in it, right? Be sincere without wax is what he's saying there. Have this brotherly, do you really have brotherly love for each other? We should as a church family. I'm talking to Victory Church now. We need to have brotherly love for each other. We are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We need to have that Philadelphia, phileo love for each other as brothers and sisters, right? But then he says, you're to love each other deeply. That's that agape love. That's that sacrificial love. 
That's that love where the motive is far more about giving than it is getting. Are you with me? Church, as we go through adversity in the future, and I don't know, COVID changed us, right? We're, you know, I don't know that we'll ever get back to normal, whatever normal was in February of 2020 when we were just hitting on all five, eight, let's say eight, it's a V8, hitting on all eight cylinders, right? And just doing church and doing our thing and boom, 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 and just everything's popping, right? And then all of a sudden, er, shut down, the world changed. We're now coming out of it. Families are divided as a result of it. It's, it's amazing all that's going on in our culture today. It's only a matter of time till it seeps in here to the church. When adversity and pressure and stress of all that comes, will you do what Peter said? Will you have that Philadelphia phileo love for each other, like a brother and a sister? We have that agape love, that deep, sincere love for each other that's more concerned about giving than getting. You know there are givers and takers in life. There are those people that walk in the room, suck all the air out, and take everything they can get, and they're gone. And you've met people like that. Don't be that person. Be that person that walks in the room and wants to know how we can give to help make your life better because we're going to sacrifice for you. That's what we need to do for each other. Adversity is going to come. Peter was concerned about it setting in there with them, the pressure. And he says, I want you to have unity and I want you to have adversity. Now, Sandra, in my slides, I can't even remember what I have next. But do I have a slide built of four? This is what I want to close with. This is what I'm going to start unpacking. I was hoping I would get the first one. We're children in the same family today. That's going to be next week. Here's what I want you to see. This was just my introduction today. Peter tells us and gives us four reasons on how and why we should have unity as a group of believers. Why? And he unpacks it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 through chapter 2, verse 10. He unpacks these four reasons on why we should experience unity as a group of believers. Number one, we are all children of the same family. Amen? I'm going to unpack that next week. Number two, we are all stones in the same building. Number three, we are all priests in the same temple. Number four, we are all citizens of the same nation. That's what he is preaching to the group of believers that are undergoing great, severe persecution in Rome. That's what we need to apply to our life. That will help us get through seasons of adversity. Now, I want to close with one more thing here. And I'm, I'm, I promise you I'm stopping right here. Sandra, I think I have a slide. It's towards the end. And it's Psalm 119. Psalm 119 about singing the Psalms. Listen, guys. The reason that I brought a verse-by-verse verse expository type sermon series to Sunday morning, typically I do a study like this in our Victory Bible Institute or a small group study or a midweek study and just go verse-by-verse verse and do this type of teaching. But the reason I brought this to Sunday morning is, number one, we have folks that would listen and hear on Sunday morning that will not come to small groups or Zoom Bible studies or Victory Bible Institute or some of our smaller breakout classes. We're in a season of biblical illiteracy. Are you with me? 2021, and by the way, it didn't just happen through COVID, but pressure does something. It reveals who you really are as you go through seasons of difficulty. Our nation, I believe, is no longer a Christian nation. As a whole, as a majority. There was a day when, from the president all the way down to the school teacher, all the way into our communities, on our jobs, in our houses, where everyone had respect for the authority of the Word of God. Whether they understood it or not, whether they believed it or not, they had a respect for the Word of God. I grew up in the era in the day 
when the stores were actually closed on Sunday. And if you needed milk and eggs, you better get milk and eggs on Saturday afternoon. You couldn't get them on Sunday morning. Why? There was a respect. It's, it's the Lord's Day. You go to church. We're closed, right? Now I realize for a lot of different reasons we're 24-7. And I understand all that. I'm not against all that. I'm just saying we're living in a culture today when the Word of God is so disrespected. I'm trying to intentionally get us back to the place where, especially at Victory Church, this is the final authority in all of life. The Word of God governs everything we do and say. Right? Regardless of political parties, regardless of ideologies, regardless of whatever the agendas may be out there, we must get back to the place where we believe what thus saith the Lord is the final authority in all of life. Now, we even have churches today that are far more concerned about your entertainment than they are you knowing the word of God. And every pastor of those churches are going to have to stand and give an account of that one day. I'm at the place in my life where I know that all I can do in this crazy world we're living, all I can do is try my best to teach and drive people back to the word of God. That's why I brought this 1 Peter verse-by-verse verse study to you on Sunday mornings. I want to feed you the Word of God. So with that being said, there's a little jingle that our family sung years ago. and It's Psalm 119, 103. Now, it's, go to the next slide. Verse 103 is verse 1. Verse 101, and by the way, if you go to johncannonnotes.com, all of this is right there in the sermon notes at the bottom. You'll want to get this because we're going to sing this together right here in just a moment. This is our chorus, okay? The chorus goes something like this. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I'm going to help you with Bible memorization. That is Psalm 119, verse 101. Let's all sing the chorus together, okay? Here we go. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I I keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Some of you are looking at me like a bullfrog in a hellstorm. Sing! Hello? Let's sing it again. Here we go. Let me hear you. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. That's the chorus. Let's go back to verse 1. Here's verse 1. I'm going to say how sweet. You repeat how sweet. It goes something like this. How sweet. Are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweet. Sing it together, honey, to my mouth. How sweet. Are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. You want the next verse? Here we go. Verse number two. Oh, how. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. That's verse 97, by the way. Oh, how. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Now, I did one more verse here. I went searching through Psalm 119. I said, there's got to be another one I can add there. So I went to 105. Thy word. Thy word. Oh, how thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word 
is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Of course, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Give yourself a hand. Good job. Right? That's called... That's called singing the Psalms, right? And you can do that all through the Psalms, and you can pull out verses, and you can make jingles like that all through the Psalms. And so I just want you to fall in love with the Word of God. It's what I want, right? So that's what we're going to do on Sunday mornings. You tell all your family and friends, it's not going to be entertainment. It's not going to be bells and whistles. It's not going to be just everything. It's going to be the Word of God is what we're going to be preaching. What thus saith the Word of God. That's what we need. In this day and age of biblical illiteracy, if we don't teach it, it'll never be taught. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Lord's Day. I'll turn it over to Brad.